it's great to be back. Uh, we were here in 2009 for the Wednesday Consortium event. I met some of you then. It's been nice to talk with you again and see how things are going. Again. Nice to meet uh, the others of you who are joining us this time. It's like a great group. I'll try to keep it uh, relatively interesting, hopefully, today uh, for my presentation. I know you've already been through several days of workshops and talks and things, and so it's, it's, I'm glad to see so many of you still around. Uh, and we'll, we'll try not to, uh, well, we'll try to keep you around. Uh, the focus of my talk today is on high-value evaluation strategies in foreign language education. I'll explain later on what I mean by high-value evaluation strategies in some detail. Um, but generally speaking, my idea and a lot of the focus of my work over the past five to ten years um, has been on, first of all, on the one hand, the fact that evaluation is often treated from a variety of, of perspectives as an accountability mechanism that is mandated and that is often received quite a negative way and seen as a pejorative undertaking. Um, and what I, on the other hand, what I'm really interested in is the potential of evaluation to contribute to understanding and improving the value of what it is that we do in foreign language education, broadly speaking, and even broader than that, in, in humanities education, um, and in particular here in language programs and education. And so um, a lot of my experience and research over the past several years has been uh, focused on figuring out, well, how can evaluation do that? How can it be a positive force or a formative force? Uh, how can these evaluating the technology? <laughs> how can, uh, okay, I'll keep going. Um, and, and what can we do about it? How can we develop capacity? How can we help people to engage in evaluation that, that makes a difference for them, rather than you know, just seeing it as something uh, sort of just a company? I've had the great pleasure of being on sabbatical for the past year, funded by Fulbright. I don't know how many people will have that pleasure in the near future, uh, with the recent budget problem. But I was on, on sabbatical last year in Germany and Spain, and um, I devoted myself to many different projects. One of them was trying to eat as much paella as possible, uh, which I think, uh, by measuring my one particular indicator, my weight gain, I think I was quite successful at that project. In addition, though, uh, another project that I, I undertook was to try to get a sense of what's happening in educational evaluation in general in Europe. In recent years, there have been a lot of movements uh, from the European Union level down that have led to many changes, just uh, really to get a sense of uh, a basis for comparison to what's happening in the United States uh, in terms of higher education evaluation in particular. Um, so I want to share very briefly with you a few insights from that before we move into uh, more of a focus on uh, our local topic today. So, well, essentially, what's go let me let me just provide uh, two contrasts to what's happening in terms of higher education evaluation in, in Europe right now. The Bologna process, that some of you may be uh, familiar with, is this uh, pan-European initiative to try to bring consistency, standards, criteria, and a variety of different kinds of evaluation methodologies to bear on all of higher education across all of the member states of the European Union. Um, in the particular case of Spain, that has recently translated into the development of a new agency, ANECA, which is responsible for all types of accreditation and evaluation that occur within the Spanish higher education context. And, and all of the other countries have something similar to this kind of agency. In the United States, in terms of higher education evaluation, we have essentially one mandated type of practice, which is accreditation. Uh, and you'll be familiar with that from the regional accreditation initiatives, um, which are associated with the different stipulations from funding from the federal government and so on and so forth. It's, it's a really important thing, but it's, it's one set of practices and processes. By contrast, what's happening in Europe, in this case in Spain, is that you have, for example, no less than seven different sub-agencies within ANECA in particular, each of them mandating its own complete, replete set of evaluation practices on a variety of aspects of what goes on in higher education uh, in Spain and, and in Europe. And so much, much, much greater evaluation bureaucracy and evaluation mandates than what it is that we've encountered in the accreditation movement within the United States. So count yourselves lucky that you're not part of Europe yet. Uh, and <laughs> it, j just to give you an idea of what that means on the ground in concrete terms, this is everything from mandating precisely what elements belong on a class syllabus, 
Yeah? So everything from you have to have a section on tests, you have to have a section on grades, you have to have a section on each class and, and what it's going to be accomplishing in terms of outcomes and so on and so forth. So every class syllabus in every class for every program in every institution all across Europe has to have that. Right? That's mandated by this, this uh, process and this kind of an agency makes sure that it happens. And that's just one of these sub-agencies and there are many, many others. How do you evaluate faculty? How do you evaluate the outcomes of programs? How do you evaluate the uh, staff and extra services and so on and so forth? So that's one extreme of what's going on in terms of evaluation in Europe. And then there's something else that's happening, a somewhat different take on evaluation. Um, if I say aix en provence you probably think of stuff other than evaluation. You think of culture and the good life in France and things like that. And indeed, uh, this region is, is very famous for a particular cultural festival that it hosts every year that focuses on, on uh, performing arts, opera, theater, uh, orchestra, and so on and so forth. What I find fascinating is that this particular uh, phenomenon has also taken very seriously the idea of program evaluation. And they have instituted for the past three years a regular meeting of the people responsible for these kinds of educational and cultural outreach projects uh, to discuss the evaluation of cultural projects. How do we go about finding out whether what we're doing is worth it? Whether it's meaningful, whether it's useful, how we can make the most of these kinds of, of endeavors. Why? Why are they doing this? In part, it's in response to European Union, Union level uh, dictates that say that you have to do evaluation in association with European funding. This is very heavily subsidized by the European Union. But what's interesting, I think, is that their approach is to invite the stakeholders, teachers, students, artists, project leaders, to this cultural event that they're going to go to anyway, to discuss the evaluation of artistic and sociocultural education project, projects and the stakes and challenges associated with it. So they're asking questions like, what effects do these projects have on participants, artists, and the community? How can we evaluate things which are by nature difficult to discern and measure? These questions should sound familiar to you. How can we evaluate and maintain a balance between results, getting results, and the process of getting them and benefiting from that process? Is evaluation a candid, honest exercise, or is it a means of political seduction? Right? These questions, I think, are reflective of a different approach to evaluation, a different idea than this multinational bureaucratic undertaking. And I would characterize these differences as, as two possible ways of seeing evaluation in association with change. I think on the one hand, we can approach evaluation as a regulatory requirement, which is an agent of change to be sure. It's going to change how we do things that's external and mandated to us. It's about maintaining control over what it is that we do, sort of a bottom line educational effectiveness kind of approach. It's about monitoring very closely and managing the, the various uh, undertakings that are associated with our programs. And that is used for comparing between programs, for determining program worth from the outside, and so on and so forth. That's one possibility. Another possibility, though, is what I would refer to as uh, evaluation as a type of educative inquiry. And this is what I'm obviously much more interested in. Um, here, evaluation is treated as the capacity for dealing with change in an evidence-based way. It's internal, it should be owned by us, that is the people whose programs are under evaluation. It's about taking responsibility for our programs, making sure that what we offer is, has some value, but also about understanding what it is that we do, helping others to understand what it is that we do, and improving what we do, bottom line. And potentially, we're doing things in these days, these might be the more important things, like defending the survival of our programs and even promoting the value of what it is that we do to audiences who need to hear about it. Yeah. So a question for us in Middle Eastern language programs then is exactly this. How do we choose to see evaluation? And how is that going to determine what it is that we do with it next? And I would like for that question to sort of uh, be a light motif for what happens over the next several days in all of our discussions. And I'll keep bringing us back to that as well. Um, because I think thinking strategically about evaluation in these terms it will help us to really make the most of it, which is the theme of the conference. So let's see if we can get there. Let me back up to 2009, though, since not all of us were here at that event. Um, we had a great time. That's why we're back, by the way. Otherwise, I wouldn't sit down. No. no, it was really, uh, really nice to interact with a, a group who is uh, coherent and cohesive as you are and talk about some of these topics. So I thought it would be useful just to recap very briefly some of the things that we talked about and the, the conclusions that we reached at that point in time, and then skip ahead to 2011 and see maybe how things have changed a bit in the, in the evaluation and the Middle Eastern language program scene. 
So quick recap. Well, one thing we talked about was that we're all having to face change in foreign language education and in humanities education in general. And this is putting incredible pressure on us as language educators uh, and humanities educators. New and increasingly complex challenges of a variety of sorts are profoundly, profoundly altering conditions for the humanities in the United States. I think that's clear. And one of the main ways that we're being profoundly altered is that uh, there's little hope that things like poetry, literature, and language can realistically compete with roads, prisons, and healthcare for direct support. And if you think in terms of dollar signs, you'll, you'll understand what's being uh, mentioned there, referred to there. Uh, so facing lots of change, and at the same time, we're under increasing pressure to evaluate our programs for a variety of reasons. Uh, perhaps the primary reason within higher education in the United States comes in the form of regional accreditation agencies who have, these are the ones, uh, uh, I suppose it's SACS here in uh, Texas, or is it North Central? Yes, SACS. SACS, yes. So uh, these agencies themselves, they're responsible for making sure that education at the college level works in the United States, and that happens through the accreditation process, as you all know. Um, the main driving uh, interest, at least in terms of our perspective, would be then the focus on student learning outcomes assessment, the demand that we do it, the demand that we report it, and that something happens on the basis of it in terms of ongoing program monitoring and improvement. Right? That's one source of pressure. Um, and that has led, frankly, to, or is associated, frankly, with a representation of evaluation that I find, at least to some degree, mm, inappropriate. Uh, and this comes out of some of the accountability movement uh, work that happened in the mid-2000s when Margaret Spellings uh, dictated that higher education institutions should measure student learning as much as the case uh, has happened here in the state of Texas in public school education, measurement being supposedly the way to make sure that education, and in our case language education, is doing a good job. This to me is a reductionist problem that associates all of evaluation and, and those kinds of things with the one technocratic approach to problem solving that is found in measurement terms. Um, so we talked a bit about that. We also talked about traditions of evaluation that we're used to and that, or that we're familiar with and that maybe are not necessarily contributing in helpful ways to us making the most out of evaluation. So the idea of the jet out, jet, jet in, jet out expert, this is the expert who comes in and is in your program for a day or two and then uh, mandates all kinds of changes on the basis of that scant amount of information. Accountability testing, of course, being another major tradition of evaluation in recent years in the US or managerial evaluation that is mostly focused on bean counting and uh, firing people. Um, under these familiar approaches, evaluation gets done efficiently, but it generally meets only program external bureaucratic or political needs. Evaluation is done to programs and teachers and learners, not with or for programs. And I think that's a, a major mistake, quite frankly. If the purpose of evaluation is to enable proactive program change, this isn't how to do it. We talked a lot about that. We also talked about misguided practices that are associated with a lot of these initiatives like accountability movements and traditions of evaluation. This one maybe some of you will be familiar with. Um, rate a prof, giving professors what they deserve. That's my favorite one. <laughs> this is, of course, the idea that evaluation is something as simple as uh, students logging onto a website and providing uh, ratings of their professors in terms of essential criteria like easiness, fairness, goodness, and you remember the other one, right? Hot. The hot factor being the most important criteria for choosing your class. Uh, not what we're talking about in terms of evaluation. It's also led, led in recent years to uh, what I would consider almost as, as negative a, a misguided practice, and that is the assumption that there is sort of a one-size-fits-all approach to measuring the outcomes of something as complex as a, a language degree program. Uh, and the heavy adoption of the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages or other available frameworks simply because they're there and they provide some set of criteria or standards to which we can map our program, supposedly. By the way, it's no longer referred to as the Common European Framework. It's now being referred to as the Common Framework of Reference for Languages. Uh, that is, it's being adopted wholesale across the world as the way of doing curriculum planning and evaluation and assessment and so on and so forth. And this I see as a, a real problem of this sort of one size fits all when you think about the kinds of outcomes that you might associate with your degree programs and then you say, well, where does that all fit in terms of this six level of band scale? Um, then you, you can start to see the problematic. 
This, of course, uh, the, the, this constellation of, of issues has, has led to a lot of negative reactions from our colleagues in the humanities. Um, the emphasis compels us to justify our values and methods by translate, translating them into the quantitative, quant, quasi-scientific method uh, in order to measure behaviors that we can't necessarily see and so on and so forth. And this is my favorite, this is a, a blogger on the MLA website. What I would much rather see is a definitive statement from the MLA rejecting this assessment of madness altogether. Let's admit that when all is said and done, what we do is not something that we can know or that can be measured. There's nothing more dangerous than saying what we do is something that we cannot know. Yeah? That, that simply reveals the fact that there is a, a sort of no basis for expressing value, no basis for undertaking change towards value, and so on and so forth. So these are the typical of the kinds of misperceptions that outcomes assessment and related accreditation evaluation uh, is supposed to be standardized measurement. I agree with them that it's not. But it's also relegating them to only be uh, realized through, through standardized measurement practices. And I think it's actually much greater and much more complex than that. And much there's a lot more positive potential under uh, different kinds of evaluation. So summarizing what we were talking about then in 2009, we uh, discussed that, in fact, a lot of foreign college foreign language educators up into the mid-2000s, this was on a survey that we did uh, in 2006, um, find evaluation generally uh, not very useful, right? They would said things to us like, it's just meaningless hoops, a waste of time, no concrete results, babble on about quality without looking at the details, conclusions drawn from evaluations have little, if any, impact on decision making. Evaluations are just collecting dust on some administrator's shelf in the dean's office. They're not getting used, right? And that was uh, the bottom, the big impression that we got from people who we talked to about the roles of evaluation in college foreign language education. We don't want that. How do we do something about that? How do we make a change? I think a lot of this has to do with misunderstandings and misperceptions on a variety of sides of evaluation. And so another thing I suggested in 2009 was that we try to re-envision evaluation as a useful process. And I think some of the people who responded to our survey uh, also found the same, the, the same possibility. People said that they feel a personal responsibility to be accountable. We have a social and moral responsibility towards our students and towards society at large. Evaluation is not punitive. It's to improve yourself. Maybe it's just a part of the feeling of professional responsibility that has been, to some extent, sort of energizing. So these are positive views, ways of vision, envisioning evaluation um, that aren't negative, that, that are uh, essential in contributing to what it is that we do as college language educators. We also talked then about, well, maybe we need to distinguish a bit more closely in terms of the terminology that's being used in this evaluation rhetoric. On the one hand, we have something that's referred to as evaluation programs, and my suggestion was that this is the superordinate category. This has to do with using a variety of possible methods and procedures for gathering evidence or information about a variety of, of possible elements within language programs. Yeah. Within that, then, is something that we would refer to as assessment. And assessment here, as it's used in the accreditation literature, really is just about assessing student learning, period. Yeah. And there's an important reason for that. We, we should be focusing on student learning outcomes and the extent to which they are or not what we expect. But that's the, the level at which we treat assessment. Evaluation is much more than that. It can include assessment, but also a variety of other uh, methods and procedures. And within assessment, there are a variety of ways of gathering information about student learning, some of which are measurement. That is, the quantification of particular constructs that represent certain phenomena that students are supposed to be learning. But there are a lot of other ways of doing assessment that aren't necessarily measurement, that aren't necessarily about quantification, but that are equally capable of providing us with useful information about what students are learning and how they're learning and what changes we might need to make in order to make sure that they're learning. Yeah. So that was a, a set of terminological distinctions that we made. Um, we also talked about what gets evaluated, and it's not just student learning. Obviously, it can range uh, from everything from the affordances underlying our educational programs, theory, context, resources, planning and development, preparation, to the concrete elements that realize our language programs, the learners, their needs, our curriculum, pedagogy, instructional practices, materials, assessments, teachers, and so on and so forth. Largely speaking, these days, what we're focused on primarily is, uh, are the concrete elements in terms of evaluating language programs and the extent to which activities are happening that are supposed to happen, outcomes, learning, and others are being achieved, 
and whether or not any of this has any value in real world terms out there to society, to learners who've completed our programs, and so on and so forth. We talked then that, yes, there are accountability purposes, but there are also a variety of other purposes that are associated with evaluation or that might be realized through evaluation, um, including a bunch of these. And given the fact that there are lots of different purposes for evaluation, we talked about the fact that tests and measures can be utilized, yes, but there are also a lot of other methodological approaches to evaluation that we need to be considering if we really want to accomplish the variety of things that can be accomplished through evaluation. Given that, with this sort of corrected vision, I suggested that the starting point for developing useful evaluations probably needs to change from what it has traditionally been. A traditional view when we think of evaluation has been something like, well, start by asking, okay, what are the outcomes targeted by the program? How can they be measured? And are they being met? Are we effective? This is a, a, a sort of received view of evaluation. But as soon as we start considering, well, who's asking for that information? Who's going to do the measuring or gathering of information and interpretation? Who's going to be held responsible for these things? Well, maybe we need to adjust our vision of useful evaluation to something like this. Begin by asking, who's in a position to utilize information for the betterment of learners, the program, and the discipline? What questions do they have about learners, teachers, courses, curriculum, the elements of language programming? What challenges do they face in doing that? And ultimately, what needs to happen on the basis of evaluation? Why are we doing evaluation? Right? This being the key, the key question that should motivate the methods that we select and so on and so forth. Procedurally, then, we also recommended this, which I'm summarizing very briefly here, but th this approach. First of all, key that stakeholders, different representatives, the people who are going to use the evaluation information need to participate in the evaluation process from the outset. And in fact, the first step in engaging in useful evaluation is figuring that out. Who are these people? How can they participate? Second, prioritizing those challenges and questions in need of immediate answers in, in uh, our language programs. Uh, there's nothing worse than trying to engage in evaluation that tries to accomplish everything, that meets everybody's needs, that answers all possible questions, that looks at all student learning outcomes, because that will inevitably fail. We can't, we, we have limited time and resources, so prioritization becomes a key in making evaluation useful or even possible. Then we start asking questions about instrumentation. We don't develop surveys first and then figure out what we're going to do with them. We figure out what we want to do, and then we go and we develop instruments. What kind of information will answer these questions? How do we get the information with available time and resources? What do the findings mean? We have to engage in cycles of interpretation in a particular context, not in the abstract. And ultimately, the final step that has to happen is follow through. What decisions and actions are taken on the basis of evaluation data collection or evidence gathering? And it's really this uh, relationship between participation by stakeholders and intended users and follow through at the end of this cycle that is the key, the key to making evaluation useful, I think. Yeah. So for us, foreign language educators, we're, we're ultimately the ones who are responsible for what happens in foreign language education. Participation, therefore, by us, by foreign language educators, is essential throughout all phases of evaluation if we're seeking some kind of relevance to our context. And a focus on the specific intended uses for evaluation is essential from the outset if the process is those are the basic messages that we, we gave then last time in 2009. That's where we were. We also mentioned this summer institute that Martha mentioned and some of their statements on the value, the potential value of evaluation in language education. And they suggested things like, well, it provides an important framework for discussion that is empirical, that is evidence-based. It can shed light on how programs function, not just what happens at the end, but how people get there. It can increase awareness and communication, both within programs and between programs. It can make student learning more efficient, ultimately, if it's utilized for that purpose. It's a way of facilitating problem solving on the basis of evidence. It can encourage heightened commitment by program stakeholders to what's going on within their programs. And potentially, it has a democratizing, unifying, engaging kind of dimension um, that we don't want to overlook. For this group of, of language educators, they suggested that evaluation enables the field to articulate and demonstrate internally and externally the unique contributions of language studies in a pluralist and globalized world. And I would suggest that that is today, even more so than in 2007, a really important thing to try to be doing within our program. We also have some meetings with you 
uh, breakout sessions from the perspective, uh, from your perspective, on the potential contribution of evaluation. And you suggested similar things. Evaluation should provide an empirical basis for systematic change. Uh, a proactive approach to targeted focused program improvements. It should give a medium for enha enhanced communication within and beyond program. And it should provide a methodology for illuminating both strengths and weaknesses and demonstrating value to the rest of the world about what happens in Middle Eastern language education. That was 2009. What's happened in the brief interim until 2011? A lot of things, actually. Uh, a lot having to do with evaluation and language education. Let me uh, quickly take us then through a SWOT analysis. SWOT analysis, some of you may be familiar with. This is an evaluation technique that focuses on getting people to determine the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of programs. Uh, in this case, I'm applying it to the question of what is the status quo for evaluation in the service of Mid Middle Eastern language programs. This is my SWOT analysis of evaluation's status quo, let's say. You may disagree with me, which is fine. That's one of the purposes of doing this kind of thing. I think there are a lot of strengths uh, that we can point to now that probably we couldn't point to so much, in two, even in 2009. Um, first of all, there is heightened awareness about the importance of evaluation and people taking action. So this is but one example. Uh, this is a talk that uh, the uh, National Middle East Language Resource Center uh, promoted at uh, the MESA conference in, in 2010. Just an example of a variety of other things that have been going on from your perspective like this. There are increasing numbers of resources that are available to you to engage in, to think about, to learn about evaluation. This is one example of resources that are made available from uh, my website at the University of Hawaii, one of the websites that we work with there. I'll make this PowerPoint available to you, by the way, so you don't have to write everything down. I'll send it out. On email. There are now which there weren't two years ago, a lot of examples of foreign language evaluation at work in uh, a variety of different kinds of contexts. Here are two examples. One is this book that we, we published, Case Studies of Foreign Language Evaluation. Another is a collection of uh, reports on evaluation in a special issue of the General Language Teaching Research. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot more engagement. There seems to be engagement coming specifically out of, uh, out of the Middle Eastern language focus. Certainly the NMELRC has uh, invested heavily in this topic in, in their current round of uh, resource center uh, projects. Uh, and the Middle Eastern Studies Center here has invested in, in bringing us here and hosting this event. And so I think that's a, a real testament to the possibilities, to the, to the level of engagement that's occurring. There are also a number of programs, I mentioned three here, that we happen to be working with who are pursuing research into evaluation, that is doing evaluation projects, but at the same time looking at how evaluation is helping them to get a language education program work done. And I mentioned here the Persian program at University of Maryland and two Arabic programs at Georgetown and, and Notre Dame. These happen to be programs that we're working with. So there's considerable engagement as well in these issues. So those are all strengths, I would say. Increased awareness, resources, examples that didn't exist before, and legitimate interest and engagement. That's great. There are probably also weaknesses that we have to contrast against the strengths. Yeah? And I would, these are just my estimates of some of the potential weaknesses anyway. I would say, as in language education in general, there's probably still a limited capacity to engage in evaluation within Middle Eastern language programs. There are very, very few published Middle Eastern language program evaluation examples that you can build on and learn from and, and utilize. We're trying to change that, and we, we will be publishing some. Um, maybe some of the purposes and methods for evaluation within your programs are still sort of uncertain or unstipulated, and that might be something that we can target as well. Um, and I would suggest that there are probably widely differing uh, needs depending on factors like what language you're teaching, how big that language is or, or not big, uh, how many resources you have, and so on and so forth, uh, as well as what, what the nature is of the program in, in general. Is it a, a language teaching program? Is it a degree program? Is it a cultural program? And so on and so forth. So these are all potential weaknesses that we want to keep in mind as we're strategizing about how to make the most of evaluation. How about threats? I think there are some really important threats that have emerged over the past couple of years that we need to be paying very close attention to. One of them, and in this case, there aren't very many Middle Eastern language programs mentioned on this list, but I have a feeling similar things are or will be happening with you as well. Um, all of these programs are gone now. Yeah, so we have, and, and many, many more, of course. We have 
we're the target. We're the very easy targets for institutions to trim, uh, to cut down on uh, uncertain programs that don't necessarily lend a lot of value that's obvious to the institution, or at least to who's paying the bill. And one of the very common remarks that's made by administrators when they remove these programs and fire the faculty is that they have no clear value to the institution. We might disagree with that. I would disagree with that as a fundamental premise. But at the same time, well, how are we going to make the case that we have value to the institution if we're not engaging in activities like empirical evaluation that's going to be able to, to support our, our cause? Yeah. So that's a real threat, and that's a, a, a big one that, that's happening a lot these days. Uh, this shouldn't be a threat. This is a publication that just came out this year by the Teagle Foundation and the MLA uh, on, you read that, on literary study measurement and the sublime disciplinary assessment. It is an unfortunate uh, association between the words measurement and disciplinary and assessment. Is it sort of, is, is the intention here that we're using assessment as a way of disciplining? Uh, I don't know, uh, maybe. maybe that, or are they talking about assessment within the discipline? Unclear, but what is clear is that uh, some very powerful voices within the, the MLA hierarchy, this is a former president of the MLA, uh, still is arguing the case against some, any value being associated with outcomes assessment or evaluation or accreditation or, or whatever. And he's suggesting that it's, a, it's problematic to sacrifice other goals in the service of standardized outcomes assessment and that in the end it's only on the scale of a whole lifetime that the worth of literary education may be measured and this is a scale that cannot be tuned. Um, so we're still seeing the same kinds of arguments coming out of very, very powerful factions within some of our professional organizations and I think that's uh, unfortunate given that these things are by no means going away, the opposite, the, the pressure to do them is heightened and that a lot of other people are actually finding quite a lot of value in engaging with these topics as a way of doing things like defending their, their programs and by the way, making them better and so on and so forth. Last but not least, as you'll all be very familiar with, uh, language and international study programs face devastating cuts under the budget deal. We don't just face them, they happened. Uh, the language resource centers uh, have been cut by 50%, so the, the work that Kirk and, and my language resource center do has been reduced considerably. Uh, among uh, many, many other uh, federal investment projects in international education. And I'm, maybe I'm pessimistic, but I have a feeling that it's going to be that way for a while, given current budget discussions. <laughs> so those are threats. Those are real threats. Foreign language programs are being closed. There's a lot of resistance to colleagues actually doing anything about it, frankly. Uh, and the defunding of international education from the federal level. John, could you go back to that slide just for one, sure. one second? Sorry, I was just I'm not quite reading what I wanted to Oh, I'm sorry, I should have read it to you. This is just from this is an article from the Chronicle of Higher Education. Federal budget plan expected to be approved by Congress would make shortcuts in foreign language and international academic programs with some university officials saying they could result in staff layoffs. Okay, that happened. I thought I thought something else. Thank you. Okay, yeah. That happened and, and indeed people were laid off. So forth. But that's all the negative stuff. What about opportunities? Can we do something about it? Can we take advantage of uh, evaluation in response to these things? Here are some opportunities I want to highlight. First of all, well, there is a commitment by the Language Resource Centers, ours, uh, at least as long as they exist. Um, there are potentially other sources of support, possibilities for collaboration, and so on and so forth. Let me show it this way. How do we get to useful evaluation in Middle Eastern language programs? I think we can take advantage of opportunities like building on the investment that the language resource centers are making. Potentially, we need to be pursuing non-governmental, like foundation support to, to look into evaluation uh, kinds of activities. I think we need to be participating, you, we need to be participating in Middle Eastern and foreign language collaborations that are already occurring on useful evaluation. I'll mention some of those in just a minute. I think we can benefit from a coalescing focus on useful evaluation in the humanities, despite what some voices in the MLA say. Others are saying very different things. And there is a mounting uh, sort of movement to, to do something about evaluation and assessment within humanities education. Uh, and I think we can contribute by doing, engaging in different kinds of scholarly practice. So publishing, presenting, and so on and so forth on evaluation in higher education and within our programs. So those are all opportunities that, that I see uh, very prominent on, on the future radar screen. SWAT, whatever. SWAT's not that useful, actually. I, I, don't, I don't encourage people to engage in strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats 
unless they're going to do something about it. So for me, I, I like to refer to it as SWAT R. This is somewhere over the rainbow. Right? <laughs> now it's not, not really. Strange so solutions, opportunity, threats, and response. Yeah? So there has to be a follow through as we talked about useful evaluation. What are you going to do about it? I think there's, we have a mandate to engage in evaluation in a different way. Can we put evaluation to work in support of foreign language education, not simply in reaction to a variety of external demands, but as a core practice, focused on better understanding and improving what we do, and as a means of demonstrating our value to society? That's one mandate. Second, can evaluation in turn help us to respond to forces that threaten the sustainability of what we are trying to do in foreign language education? I see that as a slightly separate mandate, but, but an important one as well. Maybe, how do we do it? What works? One approach then is to think and act on useful strategies for making evaluation valuable in language programs. So let me give you a few ideas based on recent experiences uh, with evaluation in foreign language programs. What are some high value evaluation strategies here? What do I mean by high value? Well, these are ways of approaching evaluation that are feasible, efficient, and produce meaningful data, but also enable program improvement, participant learning, and organizational <laughs> culture change, and ultimately communicate program worth beyond the program to other constituencies. It's a lot to expect, but I think it's possible. Lots of ways to do evaluation. The question for us then is, what do recent experiences and research indicate about which of those ways of doing evaluation can be considered high value? What are some good strategies for making the most of foreign language program evaluation? Let me give you a few. Strategy one, if you build it, they will come. Reference to a film, anybody remember that film? <laughs> build a dream. Oh yeah, well there you go. Basic idea here is that making available and providing assistance with easy to use tools and procedures can both initiate and sustain systematic data collection for evaluation. Let me give you a concrete example from the University of Hawaii College of Languages, Linguistics, and Literature, where my program resides. Um, this was a student exit survey project that was initiated by the associate dean of our college in conjunction with a committee of faculty advisors that she put together to think about what can we do uh, about evaluation and outcomes assessment. And critically, with the support of graduate assistants who had some training at the PhD level in evaluation practice. What did they decide to do? Uh, well, they decided to come up with a survey that focused on exiting students from a variety of, of programs within the College of LLL. And that survey consisted of two basic parts, one that had college level questions, so questions that the college wanted answered about things like your experiences, the resources, and so on and so forth, but also then a flexible program level set of questions that each department would uh, contribute on the basis of what they wanted to find out about student learning outcomes, about student experiences, about students' future plans, and so on and so forth. They also, critically, sent the graduate assistants out to help different programs who weren't doing any of this kind of work at that point in time to develop items, to ask questions, to think about what it is they wanted to get out of the survey, to focus on graduating students as a key sort of watershed point in programs, right? If we're going to ask anybody about the value of the program and how it's working, why not ask the ones who are just finishing the program and about to go on and do stuff on the basis of what they've learned? And the college, the graduate student, the evaluation student, administered the, the survey once developed to all of the different programs online. So there was full support in terms of collecting the data and then doing something with it. Yeah. Following through in terms of report writing and the presentation of results by the graduate student to the individual programs. Uh, so they did things like data analysis, reporting back, and facilitating making action plans for what to do next. Right? So this was the, all of the, the, the project and the kinds of support that were provided by the, uh, the College of LLL um, to all of the programs within our uh, college. So what happened? Well, as a result of this, first of all, there was a persistent, there is to this day, a persistent data stream that did not exist before this, right? There's data collected on a regular basis from everybody who's exiting any of the programs offered within our college that nobody had before. Right? So there's at least some empirical data to do something with. And that's great. And for many of this program, these programs, it's the only empirical data that exists that provides any kind of feedback to the program about how well they're doing and so on and so forth. 
It focused crucially on endpoint student perspectives, which is particularly important as a way of thinking back about what it is and all of the different experiences that you've had that's worked, where are you going next, what are you going to do with it, and so on and so forth. Now, all of the programs are at least doing something within our college. That's a really big plus in terms of getting us through accreditation kinds of uh, requirements and reviews. And some of the programs, at least, are building quite strategically from feedback. My own program, for example, has now instituted a regular annual meeting where we respond to the data and findings from the surveys by interacting with stakeholders, students and teachers, and so on and so forth, uh, and thinking about what we're going to do next, uh, given what we found. What's the cost? Well, in this case, it's essentially one graduate assistantship. Right? The college supports one trained graduate student to continue facilitating this kind of support to all of the different programs. What's the level of program impact? Well, actually 49 <coughs> programs, at the, by my count, uh, within our college are the ones who receive support of this kind. Now, that's a pretty, pretty good uh, cost benefit analysis, I would say. If you build it, they will come. One example. Two, follow the leader. The basic idea here, when program leadership takes an active role in promoting and facilitating evaluation, Things tend to happen through research, resource allocation, recognition, influence, big picture vision, and so on and so forth. Here's an example from the Georgetown Department of German, where the chair, Peter Pfeiffer there, uh, has been leading the way in a variety of evaluation efforts associated with an innovative curriculum that they began working on in the, the late 1990s. So over the past more than 10 years, they have engaged in a variety of different kinds of evaluation projects. They've evaluated the entire assessment system for the purpose of updating them and improving them. They've evaluated oral proficiency outcomes associated with the, the, the language learners, writing ability outcomes, student perceptions of curricular implementation, alumni perceptions of degree value, and currently they're working on a project evaluating the more humanistic kinds of outcomes that might be associated with their degree program. So what's the leader's role in this? Why am I attributing these kinds of things to him? First of all, he makes it possible. He has persistently provided uh, different kinds of resources, time for people to do work, funding to the extent that it's available to hire graduate students, to uh, give people summer leave, and so on and so forth, um, in order to engage in evaluation projects, which he sees as central to the betterment of the program. He himself is a direct participant in all of the evaluation projects, uh, typically as a member of an evaluation committee, um, and he himself readily uh, agrees that he has learned tremendously about evaluation and its contribution to the program as a result of doing evaluation all these years. He engages in scholarship. He has published multiple articles in refereed journals on evaluation itself and the contribution that it's made to the program. That's a different kind of leadership, a scholarly leadership. And he's taken the extra step of trying to raise local and professional awareness about the value of evaluation in language programs by organizing consortia within the institution of the different foreign language programs to talk about evaluation topics, by engaging with the ADFL and with other foreign language organizations outside of, of his institution uh, to try to get evaluation on the agenda of the professional organizations. Yeah? So this is the kind of leadership that I'm talking about. I would suggest that a lot of the stuff that has happened within that, that very innovative department of German wouldn't have had he not been committed to this particular way of going about change and innovation, that is, utilizing evaluation as a way of doing it. So what's the value? Well, we've managed to create a, a department culture that is committed to sustained evaluation use. He's raised awareness both within his program and beyond about the importance of thinking curricularly and taking action on the basis of the whole program. He's influenced people within his program, obviously, but other programs have followed suit and the institution itself. He has initiated a national collaborative effort among similar types of humanities and language programs to have a discussion about proactive uses of evaluation of this sort. And what did it cost? Well, it costs his commitment. It costs his time and certainly some department resources to get it done. But I think if you look at the program that has resulted from all of this and the impact that that program has had and that he has had on other programs, the, the payout is, is enormous. It's a tremendous. And I think it happens in this case because it's a leader who's doing it. There's really a, a, an inherent value in the leader's big vision of what's going on 
and being able to promote things in particular ways that may not come from non-leaders, from, from people who are busy doing other things, let's say. So leadership, crucial. Just do it. I hate that slogan. <laughs> However, in this case, I think it makes a bit of, a bit of sense. Um, the basic idea here, getting an initial small scale and highly focused evaluation project done can set the stage for improved understandings of the possible contributions of evaluation and subsequent program development and evaluation activities. So doing something, even if small, can lead to big changes. The example here is from the Portuguese program at the University of New Mexico, where um, a chair of that very small, less commonly taught language was interested in whether course design was appropriate to the types of learners who were appearing in Portuguese, how they might grow the program, how they might change in a way to, to sort of make the program better and bigger, fundamentally. The chair at that point really wasn't sure what to do next. So she identified a PhD student in the College of Education at the University of New Mexico who might be able to help in terms of doing an evaluation project. That person then suggested why not start with a needs analysis, which they then conducted. Uh, a very simple needs analysis doing document reviews of the program uh, as, as it existed at that point in time, holding focus groups of students and other faculty to think about the future of the program, and importantly, conducting a survey of students to see who they were, what their interests were, and why they were studying Portuguese. And what they found was useful. They found out, first of all, that there were very distinct populations of learners in Portuguese. On the one hand, those who spoke Spanish already, and those who didn't speak Spanish being cognate languages, that made a big difference in learning speed and ultimate goals and things like that. Second, uh, that there were indeed different learners with very different targets and purposes uh, in studying Portuguese. And third, the need, therefore, for two different tracks of instruction and the development of new courses and, ideally, the hiring of new faculty to teach them uh, in response to the, the obvious needs that had been demonstrated. What was the value of engaging in this small needs analysis project? Well, it gave her a very useful empirical basis for resource requests from the dean and the college which were met. She had data, she went and said, I want to do these things next and look, there's need for them. And indeed, her, that, that request was met. They identified unique stakeholder groups that they really didn't know about before and that led to uh, clear directions in terms of program change and development. It demonstrated the value of evaluation within the program and to the dean and that program has now, now gone on to subsequent uh, iterations of evaluation for on different aspects of the program, all leading to ultimately different kinds of program change in a, in a proactive way. What was the cost? It was essentially free, or ex at least extremely minimal. The, the cost of the, ED, the education PhD student was uh, that person's interest in engaging in this project, essentially. Yeah, and so this was a, a strategic way of getting help and getting something done that then led to much bigger things being done on the basis of it. So that's the idea of the just do it. Fourth strategy, I'm running out of time here, Martha, but we started late, so I don't know what to, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm gonna keep going for a little while. Okay, strategy four, all hands on deck. The idea here is that participation in all phases of evaluation by multiple stakeholders, often in the form of a committee, enhances the likelihood of learning, buy-in, and consensus building through evaluation. The example, the Duke University uh, Trinity College foreign language requirement this is a new requirement at Duke University that all students have to have a certain degree of foreign language competency before they can exit the language requirement. So not course time, but competency. Um, and this was a collaborative effort between an evaluation committee the dean of the college, and the assessment office at Duke University. So this is the idea of multiple parties participating in the strategic development of evaluation projects. Uh, multiple also in the sense that at least these four languages were represented on the evaluation committee. Okay. On the basis of their collaborative efforts, uh, first of all, they generated ideas, plans, and intended uses for evaluation. They then engaged in immediate evaluation data collection kinds of uh, work focusing on foreign language proficiency in association with the foreign language requirement, cultural learning outcomes, utilizing a variety of different instruments, and additional factors uh, like uh, 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 student factors, uh, backgrounds and experiences, which they got through questionnaires and registrar data, and students' perspectives on the language requirement. Focus groups and questionnaires gave them data on that. In this uh, this project, in the, in the early phase of this project, what did they do? They piloted all of these different kinds of data collection uh, approaches simultaneously. <coughs> the, 
They then got together, again, as a collaborative effort and interpreted and analyzed what they were finding and tried to make sense of it. And they realized that there was way too much data for them to do very much with at that point in time. It was confusing and that it was just uh, not feasible to continue this kind of assessing everything all at once uh, that they had in their original plans. So what's the value of this, this thing happening, this collaborative uh, project? The real value is not in the data collection itself. The real value is in them getting together and talking to each other <laughs> about their programs. It increased communication, both vertically, that is, uh, within the different language programs, uh, in terms of what are our goals, we have common goals for student learning and so on and so forth, but also horizontally. It really helped the dean to understand what it is that was possible even in terms of foreign language learning outcomes with this language requirement. It increased, increased collaboration across the foreign language programs as well. Obviously, they, they began to engage in uh, additional projects in terms of curricular alignment, course alignment, and so on and so forth, given the fact that there was a common foreign language requirement that they all had to meet. They came to consensus on common goals and good practices, and they gained a lot of clarity on the feasibility of collecting different kinds of data, how much data you probably shouldn't collect, and the utility of doing different kinds of assessment activities, and so on and so forth. So these are the kinds of benefits that accrue from the all-hands-on-deck attitude, the collaborative approach to uh, engaging in evaluation. Obviously, there are some time and money costs for the people involved in this, but in the end, it had relatively important impact on these four <coughs> major foreign language programs at Duke University. <coughs> I'll move quickly through this one. Where's the beef? This strategy is basically that an initial evaluation focused on stating and assessing program outcomes, learning outcomes in particular, can have long-term and far-reaching ripple effects if taken seriously by program stakeholders. Yeah. There are a lot of things we can focus on in evaluation, but focusing on outcomes may indeed be a way of uh, achieving a lot of beef in, in uh, a short amount of time. This example comes from the University of Evansville Department of Foreign Languages, their project on stating and assessing learning outcomes. This was also a collaborative effort with an initial evaluation committee deciding a lot of the, the nuts and bolts, but perpetually in, in consultation with the full faculty of the department and in consultation with a group of graduating students, senior students, who ultimately were the ones who were supposed to be achieving the outcomes and benefiting from their study in the Department of Foreign Languages. The first phase of the evaluation was the drafting of student learning outcomes for all majors in all foreign languages. These are multiple foreign languages in a single department. Then drafting, vetting, and revising them with the input of students and other faculty members. This then led to a second set phase, which was a curricular mapping exercise where all of the existing courses in all the languages were reviewed to see whether or not they were able to, uh, whether or not students were actually able to learn and the opportunity to learn the different outcomes that were stipulated in the, the student learning outcomes. And indeed, they found that there were gaps in the curriculum and gaps in the courses, and revisions were made already at this stage. And third, the development of an assessment uh, approach, an assessment program for looking at the senior level where their students were achieving the outcomes that had been stipulated. So this involved a portfolio, a presentation of the portfolio, a committee that rated the presentations and the students' abilities to do things in the portfolio, <coughs> additional objective assessments, from the outside and a questionnaire that the students filled out about their experience. What's the value of this project? What happened as a result? Well, first of all, they were able to achieve consensus on the value of foreign language studies across multiple language programs, something that hadn't existed before. And in fact, they had been critiqued by the institution for not having a statement on the value of foreign language studies. And, and they were on sort of the, the edge of uh, the potential kind of um, cutting that we saw earlier uh, in the presentation. Second, they were able to articulate curriculum and courses to the achievement of these outcomes. Uh, and that was, a, according to them, a major benefit of thinking about outcomes. Third, there was a lot of enhanced communication within the program, but also between the program and beyond the institution, because they had something to talk about, outcomes. And assessment led to changes. Just doing an initial pilot run of the assessment already led them to identifying things that they thought the students needed to be learning better. And that led to changes in courses, intensity of, of different aspects, focus in courses, and so on and so forth. Really, perhaps the, the major value of engaging in this project focused on outcomes was that the program survived, and in fact it grew. It gave them a basis for, again, making requests for faculty <coughs> additions, and so on and so forth, which they were able to accomplish. 
The cost, well, the evaluation committee, the faculty who participated on that, had to contribute a, a good deal of time over a year. Um, but it was assigned to them as part of their departmental duties. Or they volunteered for it as part of their departmental duties. So perhaps not something addition, uh, too additionally uh, heinous. And the impact was on at least the five foreign language programs that were represented within that department. So focusing on outcomes can lead to lots of different kinds of positive changes is the message here. Last one then. This is also from the same program. Beyond stating outcomes, beyond doing assessment of outcomes and acting on them to make changes, they did something very interesting. And that has to do with the basic idea of disseminating products of evaluation, as well as the fact that evaluation is being done, can lead to public awareness about the program and the extent to which its efforts are being monitored and improved. Right? So it's probably not enough just to do evaluation, but again, acting on it strategically adds different kinds of value and different dimensions to the potential benefits at the end. Here, what did they do? Well, they posted everything to the website, first of all. So they have their vision and mission and outcome statements that they came up with in all of this work directly on the website for everybody to see. They also produce brochures that they utilize in uh, parent fairs when the parents come with their children when they're deciding about what, things to, what courses to take and so on and so forth. Um, and they post the basic plan for their senior assessment that I showed you uh, on the website as well, which communicates to audiences out there in the public that they're taking seriously these outcomes. And in fact, they're engaging in assessment to make sure that the outcomes are occurring. Yeah. What does that kind of public dissemination lead to? Well, the pr prospective students and parents respond very positively. They make comments like, I haven't seen any other programs doing that. That's really interesting. Maybe I'll enroll in one of your language courses. They've had a, a dramatic increase in enrollments since they engaged in this project. People are actually taking their courses. That's probably a good thing. The institution itself has recognized these efforts and has brought members of the department on board in terms of uh, steering committees for what to do about accreditation, what to do about evaluation and outcomes assessment in other programs. And perhaps, well, at least obviously, but maybe most importantly, by making it public, by putting this stuff on the website for everybody to see, it maintains a, a self-driven accountability to students, to the learners and the public and the institution by making out the outcomes and their evaluation public. If we put it up there and we don't do it, we don't subscribe to these things, well, then we're going to look like idiots. If we put it up there, we're forcing ourselves to follow through. And that was also an intentional uh, effort by this department to say, we're committed to this for the long term. This isn't a one-shot thing. We're going to make it public, and therefore, we're going to stick to our guns and follow through. And I think in their case, it has had a, a dramatic effect on, on how they're perceived as well as how they perceive themselves. So how do we accomplish a sustainable evidence-based practice of this kind of educational decision-making and action within your programs? Well, I think it's by uh, engaging in these kinds of strategies that I've just been talking about. All of these characteristics like support and leadership and participation and prioritization, feasibility, action and dissemination, all of those characteristics are the ones that are going to lead to strategic, useful evaluation within Middle Eastern language programs. So I think it probably uh, behooves us to pay attention to the, these kinds of strategies that are emerging from recent experiences. At the same time, maybe that's not enough. Maybe what we need to be doing is not just thinking about the role of evaluation within Middle Eastern language programs, but beyond. How can evaluation serve as a bridge, a way of communicating between us and whatever else is out there? And this is in response to the bigger kinds of threats that I was mentioning before. What might work? Can we take advantage of evaluation in different ways in Middle East, Eastern language education at large? And, that's, uh, and I have answers to that. I really do. I have several suggestions that I would like to make. But it's also too important. So I want to ask you, what, what should I do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I'm not done. <laughs> Do you want to hear the, the suggestions? I'm sorry, I thought the answers were for a second. Let's hear them. Yes? Yes. Let's hear them. Uh, five minutes. Absolutely. Quick. OK. What might work? Taking events. What I'm interested in here is how we can scale up and scale out with evaluation practice to do something else, to communicate beyond our programs to other programs within Middle Eastern language education, and beyond that to the profession, to the discipline at large, to the federal government, 
policymakers, the education policymakers, and others in Congress who need to be hearing from us, really, now, dramatically, and to society at large. How can we do things via evaluation that help us to express our role in society in the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, on that map? Often left off of that. Four ideas, very quick. Why not establish a persistent venue or venues for the scholarly exchange of Middle Eastern language program evaluation projects, methods, findings, and so on? Why not participate in other opportunities for scholarly exchange on evaluation? By way of example, I'll, I'll refer you to the American Associate, uh, Academy of Religion, another domain, who have done exactly that. They've established a permanent structure within their annual conference, their annual meeting, focusing on the assessment of the religious studies major. Why? Because it's really important. They really want to answer questions like, what is the value of a religious studies major? How do we communicate that? How do we make sure it's happening? And so on and so forth. Yeah, and this, they, they, they also then are committed to a sustained dialogue on effective means of maintaining and refining what we do well and identifying and improving what we do less well. Yeah. This has benefit within their discipline, but also in communicating about their discipline to the outside world. Why not do something similar within your professional organizations? Could you not take it down? I have no idea whether you can these are the relevant uh, <laughs> venues, but I'm just throwing them up there as a suggestion. Could you not come up with uh, a space in Mesa somewhere in the conference as well as the publications that's persistently addressing these kinds of topics? Um, could you not then be contributing beyond that to the larger language education uh, milieu and foreign language annals, language teaching research, who, by the way, publish regularly on these topics? We would like to hear from your domain there. Could you not? convince or at least uh, participate in convincing these bigger professional organizations related to language education to pay more attention to evaluation and assessment related topics. I think they need to be. Second, why not develop a network of practice focused on program evaluation in Middle Eastern language education? I'll get, there's a parallel example to this that's happening uh, among several institutions now called the Consortium on Useful Assessment in Language and Humanities Education. This is a consortium that uh, has agreed to put in uh, their own resources to develop a, sort of a public service site focused on web-based resources for useful evaluation and assessment, the hosting of annual meetings, programs, uh, facilitating program-to-program -program collaborations between like languages, and the exchange of instruments for doing evaluation and assessment kinds of activities. Maybe something like that would be feasible within the, this group as well. Why not initiate a standard practice for voluntary Middle Eastern language program peer review with procedures and criteria developed by the discipline with recommended self-study guidelines and with teams of trained external evaluator peers from all participating programs? I don't know if that's possible. It's the kind of initiative that TESOL, the English language teachers, undertook at the beginning of the last decade that led to the creation of an entire accreditation uh, body, the uh, Commission on the English Language Program Accreditation. So this was initially a homegrown effort that wanted to promote excellence in English language teaching through evaluation according to standards set from within by the discipline of English language teachers. This was initiated by TESOL. Eventually, it grew on its own into a much bigger uh, kind of thing. I don't know if you want to get into the business of accrediting each other. However, this is just an example of, of what that, uh, the, the possibilities are out there, I think, for uh, advancing our own standards and holding us ourselves accountable to our own standards. Not necessarily through accreditation, but through some kind of review process. Lastly, why not seek foundation, not federal, foundation funding to support a large-scale evaluation of individual and social impact related to Middle Eastern language programs in the United States? This is the biggest suggestion, and, uh, but I think it's also the one that would have the most impact. For example, Spencer Foundation is very interested in research that explores the purposes and values of education. They say things like, we value education for its contributions to civic, political, and community life, for its role in advancing social justice, for its capacity to open the people uh, to people worlds of cultural and artistic excellence, and in the largest sense, for its contributions to human flourishing. I would suggest that a lot of those values are the ones that we're trying to promote through Middle Eastern language programs as well, in addition to others, probably. Yeah. Spencer puts money into research on these kinds of things. Yeah. How about doing something like posing a research question? What is the value of Middle Eastern language and culture education programs in the United States? How about adopting some kind of methodology from evaluation, like a most significant change approach, where we go about collecting impact narratives 
from participants in the variety of programs that we, we deliver, Middle Eastern language programs that we deliver, and the different aspects of those area study centers, study abroad, the institutions and degree programs, communities, and so on and so forth. On the basis of those collected narratives from across the United States, we have a stakeholder <coughs> committee or a set of committees who review narratives, determine the range and type of impact that your programs are actually having, identify gaps, where are there supposed to be impacts that don't come up from uh, participant narratives, and establish baseline value statements that represent the best that Middle Eastern language programs have to offer, that represent the value that you have to offer to society and so on and so forth. And not only that, but then strategically disseminating the, the outcomes of this particular study within the disciplines, to each other, to other language educators, through the press, at a Middle Eastern education policy summit where you invite the important people uh, from the federal government, the educational policy makers, for example, through congressional letter writing, and testimony, and so on and so forth. Yeah? So that's the kind of strategic end point to this kind of a larger scale foundation funded uh, initiative. Those are just four ideas for what might be possible. I'm sure there are a lot of other possibilities out there. The point here is not to be frowny faced about this. Uh, the evaluation, evaluation, to sum up, it's up to you. Obviously, there's lots of pressures to do evaluation. Why? Why? Or why is that all out there? We need to understand that. Maybe the roles for evaluation are still uncertain within your program. We need to resolve that. Uh, and it's challenging to get started and sustain feasible, useful evaluation. I agree with that. At the same time, not so friendly faced, there are considerable resources and support available, and this is the ones that I directed you to earlier. And there are, uh, I have offered you, I hope, some strategies for making evaluation useful, and I can talk a lot more about a lot of other strategies if you want to hear them. And, I'm smiling to say, the things, I think there are real possibilities right now for putting evaluation to use within your programs for obvious ends, as we've discussed. I think scholarly exchange is probably key and might, might reap diverse benefits if you engage in exchange about evaluation. And lastly, maybe large-scale evaluation projects across the discipline could help us to demonstrate and focus more on the value of Middle Eastern language programs. Um, it's up to you, though. What should you do about it? This question, then, should guide us in our discussions over the next few days. And I'll stop there. <laughs>